here it is. The game that can single-handedly prove to game developers and studios alike that turn-based combat still has a place in AAA RPGs. It's been a very long time since a completely new IP has formed such massive clouds of desire in my mental sky. The trailer for this game was just on loop in my head. I'm so excited. So to deal with that, I went through all of the available media I could find, which isn't much, but it, I did it with the intent to share everything that there is to know right now about the game. Feel free to fill in the blanks in the comments below if you think I missed something, but I think I did a pretty good job. I'm Solace, this is Solace and Dread. We produce analytical content as well as nuanced discussions primarily focused on video games. If you like that kind of content, consider subscribing. So this video is gonna be broken into five main categories. A breakdown of the combat, the plot, the characters, the setting, and the developing team's inspirations. Just so you know, it is chaptered below for ease of use, so jump ahead to wherever you feel is necessary. Let's start with the first thing that caught everybody's eye. The sweet, sweet turn-based combat. And yes, this game is turn-based, but it is enhanced with stylish real-time actions. So let's look at the combat screen in depth. On the left-hand side, there is the turn order up in the top left, signifying which party member's turn it is, or if it's the enemy's turn. You can apparently flee from combat or decide to skip the current character's turn, as indicated at the bottom left of the screen. Now, looking at the bottom right, there's the active party members indicated by the character portraits, their health bar, and a numerical value for their HP, and the blue bar below it is a kind of action point called charges. Charges seem to let you pull off some extra moves or add potency to some of your attacks. We'll look into that a bit more in a second. So here, during Gustav's turn, it seems like he has four options, but this may change depending on the time spent in the game or the character's abilities or who the active character is. By the way, I love the very Persona-esque menu system. Like, I love that. I might not be a big Persona fan myself. I can't say anything about the style. Let's go over each of the options. The left trigger opens to aim. Now what this does is allows a character that has a ranged weapon or ability to free aim for specific targeted weak points on an enemy. Watching Gustav's attack, it appears that each shot is consuming a charge. It does say augmented aim, so I don't know if that's the same as free aim, but it does seem like that reticle in the center would indicate free aiming is possible. Also back into the menu, there's the options for items, skills, and attack. We don't see which is selected, but we can assume that it's the skills menu. In the skill menu, we're given a very fleeting look at six of the abilities. On the first on the list is overcharge. It seems to cost four charges, but varies based on the charges used. It's unclear, but it seems you can apply more charges than the initial cost of the attack. Then there's marking shot at the bottom. That applies two charges and applies a debuff called mark. It's unclear what the debuff does. We can only speculate what that would do. Then there's the three abilities to the right. They're never scrolled over to to see the details, but if I had to guess, the top one is a fire spell. The middle one is perhaps an attack buff, and the bottom one is a recovery spell. But let's talk about that middle one on the left, which is Lumiere Assault. That is the one that the player selects. The traits are that it has low physical damage and hits five times. Now I wanna to touch on the critical aspect. I believe that this is the timed hits that are visible in the attacks rather than the normal verbiage of a critical hit, which is kind of random spiked damage. It says that landing each critical hit gives a charge back to the character. It's safe to assume that charges are accumulated in skill attacks like this and perhaps there's a set amount recharged per turn. Um, there also might be items for it. I also happen to know that they are accumulated in defensive actions, such as parrying. And speaking of, let's take a look at the screens during the enemy turns to analyze how defensive actions work. On the bottom left, you'll see that you have a number of options. There's a gradient, 
parry, dodge, and jump. Now, I suspect that these are reaction commands that should be used during certain attacks and have counter damage properties. My elf, for example, seems to strike for 2000 damage when she does her jump here. Here we see Gustav parry an attack from a mass of enemies, but there's no damage shown. So we don't really have any clue as to what can be done after that. However, we do see that he gets a charge back after a successful parry. And then here we can observe Seal, which I might be saying her name wrong, but I see that she's holding like one of those double-edged weapons and I've always been a sucker for that, like always. But she's dodging a large sweeping attack, but it cuts away too soon to see what the reward is for doing that. And then here we see Mael perform a gradient counter attack, which doesn't seem to cost any charges, but also does not give one. And this is different from the counter attack that is shown earlier in the trailer, which might be available after a dodge or a parry. The term gradient seems to align with how the color of the background and setting has changed with the attack. I wonder how much color will play a factor since everything in the game seems to have like a paint motif. Even their like attacks, it looks like they're you know, sweeping paint brushes. This is just my speculation. I don't really know anything there, but everything really seems to have a paint motif. I wouldn't be surprised if Gradient is referring to color. I'd also like to call attention to Mael's status of stanceless. I'd imagine that she has different stances in combat that allow for different fighting styles. And you see Loon here has the four colored orbs that are on her name in this screen. This is signifying her seemingly unique attacks called elemental stains. Again, adding to my paint motif theory. And in this screenshot, it shows that casting spells lets you accumulate them. I'd speculate that it applies some elemental properties to enemies and allows you to exploit weaknesses, but this is only speculation. We can also see in this screenshot that there is a gradient charge indicator. This is the only time we have seen it, and it happens to be on Loon's uh, attack screen, but we don't really know enough to know how it works. Between each of the characters, it seems that they all have very unique properties, which is something that the devs have wanted to point out to us. And defensive turns seem to matter just as much as the attack turns, if not more so. We've yet to see how the skill trees or character synergies affect gameplay, but we know that this is going to be a big part of the game as well. I would probably expect some kind of quests where character development and growth between the developing relationships of the characters will affect certain stats that carry over into the combat. The combat is clearly going to be pretty deep. This is everything that I could find in the combat section that isn't kind of obvious, but uh, let me know if you saw something that I didn't. Now I wanna to move to the overarching plot of the game, which is one of the things that really drew me in. It's a crumbling, bleak and twisted world. And year by year, the Paintress wakes up and paints upon her monolith. She paints a number and everyone of that age turns to smoke and fades away. And year by year, that number that she paints ticks down and more people are erased. Tomorrow, she'll wake and paint the number 33 and our heroes will depart on their mission to destroy the Paintress so she can never paint again. With only one year left to live, Gustav and Mael and their fellow expeditioners embark on a desperate quest to break the cycle of death. The heroes will follow the trail of the previous expeditions and discover their fate and the secrets of the world, all while the members of Expedition 33 learn to work together against impossible odds. One thing I'm speculating here is that early in the quest, you're clearly leaving with a lot of expeditioners, and at some point you end up with just a few of you. In the trailer, there's a clip of one of the women saying that they're the only ones left. Do you mean we're the only ones left? And coupling that with a shot of a pile of dead expeditioners, it's possible that everyone on the journey dies pretty early on, except for the four that we know of. I love that they're setting the grim expectation right up front. And it kind of actually gives me a little bit of worry. Like, how are they going to be able to fit humor and a little bit of levity into this game? They they really have the a challenge stacked ahead of them. I think a great story will be able to touch on all ranges. I hope they're able to pull it off. <laughs> we'll see. On that note, let's take a look at the characters themselves. 
There's going to be a total of six characters in your party, but we only currently know four of them. Though we did cite one who is not named, and it's unclear if he's a permanent party member or not. He kind of looks like, like a traveling merchant or maybe like some kind of guide. We'll find out more when the game comes out or in a future, you know, media release. But it does seem like they're likely from the outside world as they're not donning the Expeditioner's clothing like all the other characters are. Gustav seems to be a very central and likely main character. And he's voiced by the amazing Ben Starr, who voiced the legendary Clive from Final Fantasy 16. I love this guy's performance in Final Fantasy 16, and I mean, it's kind of easy for me to say this because I don't have a ton of favorite voice actors, but he is one of my favorite voice actors of all time after his performance in 16. Plus, you know, I'm a fan of this guy's antics on social media, so. Gustav seems to have lost some people close to him, as illustrated in the trailer. But loss and death are a recurring theme for everyone in this world, so I'm interested to see what else they cook up for him. He's an engineer, and he grew up feeling suffocated by the Paintress's looming presence over the world. He's dedicated his life to the city's defense and agricultural systems, wanting to protect and provide for his people. Now, as an expeditioner, he devotes the last year of his life to defeating the Paintress and reclaiming a future for the children of Lumiere. Now there's Loon, the scholar and mage. She's a daughter of prominent researchers and has a deep thirst for knowledge, vowing to complete her parents' work, which is unraveling the mystery of the Paintress. Her role is to chart a path for the expedition, and therein she finds the weight of responsibility on her shoulders. I also love that she's kind of like a battle mage. You know, her moves look the coolest to me out of everybody so far. Then there's Seal, which again, I don't know if I'm saying her name wrong, so I apologize, but she's a farmer turned teacher. She enjoys life day by day. She's accepted that death looms over her life, but behind her warm smile is a painful past. Unlike her incredibly determined partners, she's not worried about the prospect of failure. And then lastly, there's Mayal, the shy loner. She's been an orphan for most of her life, and she's never really been able to connect with or trust anyone, except for her foster brother, Gustav. Though she's only 16 and not facing a most imminent death, she travels with the expedition as a chance to see the world before she has to have the decision made for her. Admittedly, out of all the characters that I've seen so far, Mayel is probably the most interesting to me. We'll see. Now let's talk about the inspiration that this game has clearly taken. It reminds us starkly of the combat systems of like Legend of Dragoon or Resonance of Fate, even the Mario RPGs. There's a very, very strong comparison to be made to Lost Odyssey from the darker tones to the high production value for a turn-based RPG. Just everything about this screams Lost Odyssey. And I hope that I'm not misplacing my thoughts on that. I hope there is some correlation there because that was a fantastic game. There is definitely some Final Fantasy X elements there that are kind of impossible to ignore. The pilgrimage following in the behind the journey of the other pilgrimage. You know, there's there's some obvious draws from Final Fantasy X as well. The developing team, they all shared their favorite games on their main website. And I'm not gonna read them all because it's quite varied, but the CEO and creative director, he loves Persona 3, Devil May Cry, Demon Souls, and Final Fantasy VIII. And you can clearly see some inspiration from the, all, of, all of these games. But all of these games in the list that I've seen are quality picks or quality franchises. We'll probably see draws from some of the most legendary games ever. But I do think that this game regardless of what the inspirations were or however we can compare it to something else, I really think that this game is going to have its own identity and doesn't necessarily need to be compared to anything else. All right, and then let's talk about the setting or the visuals. This is obviously a French game developed in France with French art st strewn throughout it. This is a very, very French game. And this is uh, inspired by the Belle Epoque period of France, which is the beautiful era 
of France. And that happened between the Franco-Prussian War of 1871 and the start of World War I in 1914. This was a period characterized by enlightenment, regional peace, economic prosperity, colonial expansion, technological and scientific innovations, and of course, a cultural art boom. The art of the time is extremely recognizable. World famous artists such as Van Gogh, his paintings flourished during that era, though it was shortly after his death because he never got that respect in life, but such as the way of art. This also includes impressionist art that you can clearly see inspiration from, like the Scream or View of Toledo. You see this beautiful era of France being portrayed in this game, all with a crumbling sense of twisted reality slapped on top. By the way, all the art stuff, I just looked it up. Uh, I'm not some kind of art guru or anything. I don't, I barely, come on. I do find it interesting though, that all of the attacks are almost made like brush strokes too. You know, I mentioned that earlier, but the art direction of this game is like pretty insane. I'll be surprised if it does not win the, you know, 2025 art direction award during the game awards. Like that'd be crazy if it didn't. And a little bonus, there have been full musical tracks released and they're playing under the my talking in this video. So be sure to check them out. Link is in the description. Anyway, this is a ton of work. Uh, and <laughs> um, I had to figure all this out without any resources. So uh, if you thought I did a good job, consider giving it a like or even better, share it. And I appreciate you watching up until this point. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. And we'll be talking about this game a lot more in the future. Long live the Turtle Kingdom.